Corey, is there a in WinDebug when you restart uh, the program, does it keep your breakpoints, or do you have to put them there again? It doesn't unless you use the bu okay. command. But uh, maybe Zeno knows another way. I, I know if you use the bu command. Sorry, I missed the uh, question. What was it? Um, um, I just noticed when I would restart the program in WinDebug, my breakpoints would be gone. I wasn't sure if there's a way to keep them. Wait, sir. Bu the b the b. So you keep with your contents. You know, I'll talk, I'll show her how to use my method. And you can address it afterwards. So um, if you use the bu command, it's like it says break unresolved or something like that. It will actually. Um, With the BU, it will, if I restart here, it'll still be there. Also, is there a way to list the breakpoints that you have? Uh, BL, BL, so like breakpoint list. And if you want to delete certain breakpoints, you can type like piece. You'll see this index number on the left, zero, which is my first one. You can use BC0 or BC1 or something like that. Or if you want to get rid of all of them, you can do BC star. So if I also do like BP, Mr. Evil. I can do like BC1, get rid of it. So for you, those of you that came back in, um, have any of you gotten the calculator to slump? So what I could say is that to exploit this without using any null characters at all, but I didn't put Metasploit on and you know get the calculator to spawn with no null bytes, but I didn't put Metasploit on the SVM since um, the company didn't like that. So I'm just saying to change your shell code to CCs, basically. Cool. Okay, so the uh, what I have them working on now, for those of you that have gotten the calculator to spawn, is uh, change your shell code to CC bytes, just OXCC, which will execute a software breakpoint when you um, run them, and try to construct your payload so that you have no null bytes in it at all. Because sometimes, you know, the, the overflow is in like an ASCII string function, like a string copy, so you can't have any null bytes in there. That's nasty since they address us. Yes. But there are this bots? Yeah, sure. And in fact, there's kind of like a clever trick that Windows Exploit developers use often in this case. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, um, for some reason I got my NOP sled and my shell code and then I overwrote the EIP and it's going to my NOP sled yeah. and, you know, it's running. But then for some reason I end up getting an access violation. And it doesn't launch the, the calc. That's what I so got too, Scornwell. So yeah, explain so, what um, you discovered was happening there, Zeno. So I didn't like dig into it, but okay, V is saying she thinks it might be a stack alignment issue, but I don't think so because it should have aired out earlier. I just basically moved my my shell code earlier in the file, so mine was like at hex 200 into the file. I moved it to hex 100, and it just magically worked. Otherwise, like Corey was saying earlier, you could throw like a subtract. You could you could do some manipulation of ESP, but I'm not entirely. I mean, that's probably what it is, but you would have to actually step into the function it's calling in order to determine that was the cause. But just so what's first probably, moving your shell code earlier. Yeah, so what's probably happening, Sam, is that um, ESP is pointing, is pointing like kind of near your shell code or EBP or some other variable the uh, shell code is referencing when it executes. 
is pointing where your shell code exists on the stack. So one of those things like writing stuff to the stack, you know, call arguments to launch the calc, it's actually over oh. in your shell code. So what you can do is like do an add or subtract ESP or whatever at the beginning of your shell code or write in your no op sled to make sure that ESP is, is pointed in a safe place where you're not going to cooperate with your own um, shell code while it's executing. But what you um, or you can just move your shell code around in the file because it'll probably put it in a safe place. Okay. So for any of you, like uh, Sam and others that have gotten the calculator to spawn, start thinking about how you would um, replace your payload so that it was free of null bytes. All right, so let's assume that you can change, you can make Metasploit generate calc shell code that doesn't have null bytes, but um, I don't have Metasploit on here. So just assume that your shell code is just the OXCC, OXCC bytes, which is software breakpoint bytes, and uh, replace your shell code with that and then try to um, make your payload have no null bytes in it at all. So your shell code doesn't have any null bytes in it, it's just OXCC. So you're basically your return address can't have any null bytes in it. So what do you do? What do you do? Yeah, so let me, uh, I'll start giving some hints on my screen to show you where you're at. So um, with part of this lab, like I mentioned before, we want to be exactly precise. We want to write just the return address, nothing else. Um, because if we write too much data, like the F3 call, the vulnerable F3 call lets you read an OX800 bytes, but if you may give it an OX800 byte file, it's actually just going to crash before it uses that uh, return address because it's going to get past the limits of the stack. So you want to just snipe that return address and then let the program keep going. So assuming I'm trying to accomplish that, here's what I'll do. So I'm going to do a beginning. Got a breakpoint set for the mystery function thing. I want to um, come down here to the F read call. Where's it happening? Right here. So I think this is about where you're at, man. I'm just going to do run the cursor on it. Okay. So let's see what arguments are passed to F read. Remember, we always want to look at the. Uh, Hit the stack, hit the right before the corruption, and then right afterwards. So I know that uh, F3 takes four calls, uh, four parameters rather. <coughs> the only ones I really care about are, um, are this is the buffer I'm reading into, 12FB68, um, 800 bytes. All right. Now, where is the return address on my stack? I know that EEP points to about where my return address is. So I can see that my um, return address is at stored at address 12FF74. This is 70, that would be 74. Everything so far? And so I can. The difference between those is one, two, and three. thirty-six bytes. So, if I was to create a file um, with byte writer or whatever that had one thousand and forty bytes. I offset 1,036 into the file would be where I'm overwriting that return address. So let me do that now. I'm going to go ahead and change the right to the hello there.min file that we discover is where it's trying to read from. I'm just going to change this to a NG. It doesn't matter because I'm going to be replacing that stuff anyway. Thousand forty. Is that how many bytes you need to write? All 
right, these last bytes should be overriding the return address based on my calculations here. To offset 40C into the file. So just to um, confirm that, I'm going to replace this dead view stuff with A, 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 A. And when I run it, I should see um, EIP equals A, 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 A in the crash. So, So when you exploit a vanilla stack overflow like this, where you're overwriting the return address, let's say my stack is growing down here, and I have like my buff here, we'll say it's like 512 bytes. We'll say it's like a, 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 a. Then up here we have a save frame pointer, save. EBP and um, save return and then more stuff up here. When a vanilla stack overflow happens, when it goes to use this um, save return address, when all this is clobbered, blah, 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 A's. ESP is pointing right here. Right? right when it executes that return instruction, ESP points here, because return is basically doing pop EIP, pop into EIP. So right after the return address um, is put into EIP, ESP will be pointing right here. So what you see a lot of ex Windows exploits do, um, both for reliability and for um, getting rid of null bytes, is they replace the return address not with the address of their shell code, but with the address of a jump ESP instruction. And jump ESP uh, compiles into FFE4, I believe. So if ESP is pointing at an instruction that does jump ESP or the FFE4 byte codes, it's going to jump right here, and then what the attacker does is he just puts his shell code right here. So in your calc shell code, you'll see like OX, F, E, something, 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 I don't remember all the, the byte codes associated with that calc shell code. And what this does is two things. We can't hard code stack addresses directly because the most significant byte of them is a null byte. I'll, I'll talk about you can kind of get around that as well. But you can't hard code these stack addresses because they have null bytes. So we can't just overwrite the return address with a stack address. Also, hard coding stack addresses and Windows exploit payloads is kind of frowned upon in general because the Windows stack is highly dynamic and um, it will be hard to predict you know, these addresses will be very reliable across lots of different systems. And when you want your exploit to be as reliable as possible. But the location of these jump ESP instructions in a code section are much more reliable than stack addresses, just in general. So it's much better to just hard code the address of a jump ESP than it is to hard code the address of the stack. So that's how you do that. Another way, um, what Ford did over there is um, in x86, the most significant byte the, uh, the most significant byte comes last in a 32-bit address and the least significant byte comes um, first. So let's say we have saved EDP here. and then the saved return address here, which is typically like 0, 0, 4, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, something like that. It's kind of like, that was what the return address usually is when it's, you know, hasn't been corrupted. This points into our text section somewhere. What you can do is 
this most significant byte, this 0, 0 byte, will actually be the last byte on the stack for this 32-bit address since the addresses are backwards. It's sort of a little Indian world. So this would really appear as, if I was to write it out as bytes, O O one O four zero zero zero. So if my shell code is located at address one two, we'll say zero zero one two F F like one two or something like that, I can just overwrite the first three bytes of this with one two F F one two or something like that, and then leave that null byte in place, and then I will still have pointed the return address in my shell code, all because the way it's ordering these um, addresses. This has actually been used by some reliable um, exploits in the wild, and you can even bypass ASLR in this way in a lot of cases. Because with ASLR, what you'll see is that only the most significant bytes change because really the, the only thing that's changing is the, uh, the base address for where things are loaded, like the stack and um, DLLs and so forth. So these most significant bytes will be the only ones that change. You'll see like 13142422, but this FF12 will remain. That was fun, Corey. You can put it back up there. I was just asking Bill, but I forgot that Bill is who is sharing the screen, so I forgot I was going to that screen. So yeah, I just wanted to see what address you had up there. Okay, so let's assume that I have some um, some stack address like one two f f c c. In the presence of ASLR, what you'll see is that these addresses, the most significant bytes, change is the stack is like coming in at a different base address each time, but the offset isn't really changing because the offsets in the modules don't change with ASLR, only the base address is modules. So what some um, ASLR bypassing exploits have done is they just overwrite the least significant bytes of things, and if they can make these least significant bytes just by modifying them, point at attacker controlled data, then um, you bypass ASLR because you don't even need to know what these bytes are because they'll already be put in place there in the application in the application's regular execution. So, for instance, I showed you before that um, you can get arbitrary code execution like an exploits one just by overriding the same frame pointer, which takes a little longer. So if we were to just overwrite the saved EBP, we know that the most significant bytes of saved EBP are going to be the stack address. And let's assume we don't even know what it is because we're in an ASLR environment, so let's say zero zero question mark question mark, and this is typically uh, one one two two. If by modifying these two least significant bytes, we can make a point at attacker controlled data, we can get arbitrary code execution. And it's because by modifying the frame pointer, not even the return address, we can get arbitrary code execution because of that um, leave return style construct. Uh, I don't want to talk about the details of that attack too much because it's a little bit hairy, but it's all described very well in the exploits one slides. But just know that you can get arbitrary code execution just by modifying the save frame pointer. And um, you know that attacker controlled data on the stack is going to be 0, 0. These bytes you don't know because of ASLR. But if I can just modify these and modify the offset into where this in the offset into the stack where the save EVP is pointing, then I'll have arbitrary code execution. And I didn't have to know where the stack was actually based, so I bypassed ASLR. Okay. So, um, so that's that about 
the null byte situation, but like I said for this class, we don't have to worry about null bytes. We're just assuming everything's like a binary protocol. It's a totally valid assumption to make. So let me just show you guys how I would work through this mystery vuln lab uh, up to this point. So maybe you can uh, get some ideas from the process I would go through. So I already showed you how to calculate where the return address is getting overwritten, which is um, right here. So what I want to do now is put my shell code in here somewhere. So I'll put it like right here on this. I missed that calculation. Could you repeat it? Yeah. So um Okay, so I'm going to go to the F read call, the vulnerable F read call, which is where the buffer overflow is occurring. And I know at this point the buffer I'm reading stuff into is located at address 12FP68. Because that's the, uh, you know, the buffer that's getting passed to fread. Now I want to see where my return address is on the stack. And my return address is at 40, or is that a 12FF74, which is a 401100 value. And so the difference between the two is so is uh, 1,036. So after I've written 1,036 bytes into that buffer, I'll be overwriting the return address on the stack. Okay, so 12FC68 will be my return address that I want to use. Another miss. Try again. Yeah, I agree with uh, Scornwell. You might want to throw some no-ups before that and then just call it close enough. Um, Although that's well, not precision, sorry. Beginning. It should just equal the address of the buffer, which is 12FB68. Okay, so I'm going to write Okay, so you guys chose wisely where you put your shell code. I chose unwisely. So that's the way it goes. Um, but essentially what often happens is when you have your shell code on the stack, uh, an ESP is pointing at the stack somewhere. When your shell code is executing pushes and pops and push ADs and stuff like that, you can end up clobbering your shell code. And all kinds of bad things will happen. So you can move your shell code around or you can add like add ESP or sub ESP stuff at the beginning of your shell code to make sure ESP is pointing in a safe place. But um, I got more material I want to cover, so going through all that is uh, not really worth it. Have you ever seen anything in the wild that actually used that? wrote shell code and then the shell code executed, modified the shell code dynamically and kind of wrote the real shell code that way is kind of obfuscation. Oh yeah. yeah and Metasploit can generate shell code that does that kind of stuff too to make it harder to, um, you know, to detect what's going on. Yeah, just sort of the, uh, the nasty stuff that can happen when your shell code is executing in a data region that is obviously being dynamically read and written to. So the other thing I was uh, talking to Zeno about and Veronica with the contest I gave them was how would you do this 
with uh, no null bytes, and I'll just show you the process I would take for figuring that out. So, this is some handy uh, wind debug tricks. So first of all, I know I want to do jump ESP and then put my shellcode right after um, the return address. So, and handy thing about wind debug is like, oh, what's the instructions for jump ESP? Because you have to know, first of all, the bytecodes for it and where you can find it in other modules. So I'll do like A, This A command allows me to like assemble um, x86 instructions on the fly at when you bug, which is pretty handy. You just type A and then type in the commands you want to, the x86 commands you want to do, then press enter on a blank line and automatically assemble them. So that's kind of handy if you're trying to like kernel debug and want to try to save yourself at the last minute by changing some instructions around. Um, but in this case, I can see using that special thing, that FFE4, which our, we already knew is the bytecode for uh, jump ESP. So okay, I need to point the return address at jump ESP, like at a place where jump ESP exists. I can't just set the return address equal to FFE4. So I have to figure out where in a um, the process address space this exists. So let's see. LM tells me um, where the modules are located, and I want to find. Um, a jump ESP in a DLL, and I want it to exist in an address that doesn't have any null bytes. That way, my payload can contain no null bytes. So I'll try an NT DLL first, I guess. So So this command is a little bit goofy, just to tell you guys what's going on. I'm doing a search starting at NTDLL, the size of which is B2000, which is basically just the entire um, you know, size of NTDLL. You can tell just by looking at the two addresses, this is where it starts, this is where it ends. Um, and then the bytes the byte you want to search for. So if I was to do... Change my return address or right here to DAFC 917C. All those bytes are totally good. And then Let's assume this is like some legit Metasploit shellcode I just generated and I told Metasploit not to generate any no, no bytes or whatever, but in reality it's just software breakpoint shellcode. I use this stuff all the time when you're trying to figure out get your stuff working. You can get your CCs to execute. Or you're in the red zone. And eventually, hey, um, the CCs execute, you can tell they do because you get these break instructions as soon as uh, EIP equals them in your debug mode. And if um, all this nasty shell code from all my failed attempts wasn't here, then um, we would have no null bytes now. And we'd still be executing user-injected instructions into the file. Uh, user-injected instructions into the process. Do you have any questions about all that? That we just went through. The script uh, the searching for particular bytes. Uh, what do you mean scripted? Um, I mean, I just saw Wendy Bow get search for it, right? Yeah, but you have to type it in every time. Um, so you kind of use that as like a gadget. You can script Windybug to find gadgets and stuff like that. In fact, there's like this whole pretty interesting blog post about this guy that did it. But whenever I'm developing an exploit, I need to find stuff like this. I have a uh, just some C code I've written or Python code that uses a disassembly engine. 
and it does it all for me. I mean, you could do it in WinDebug, but the WinDebug stripping language is a little bit esoteric. All right. How do you guys feel about that? I'll be at a class morale barometer at this point. Soul crushing you? You know it's bad when the instructor has to try like four times to get something to work. Oh, free. So yeah. I may not understand the, the ASLR uh, comment. So still, we are hard coding the you know, library's address of uh, jump yeah. to ESPA. Right. Right? So but, that, uh, that address would not. Okay. It can, but that address is generally much more reliable than stack addresses because typically you're trying to exploit something like a multi threaded um, Windows server or something like that. And a stack is going to go around like crazy depending on like how many people are connected to the server and so forth. And as long as you know like which um, version of NTDLL or whatever they're using, you'll know what that address is, assuming that ASLR isn't in play. If ASLR is in play, I'll talk about how you get around that. Okay, all right. Thank you. In general, though, the takeaway is DLL addresses are much more reliable than stack addresses. Stack addresses are the last thing in the universe you want to hard code in the Windows exploit because they're super dynamic. Heap addresses you can hard code, but only after you heap spray. We'll talk about that later. Okay, so um, 